Uh, good morning everyone, my name is Sebastian uh, Brizard, I'm from Laboratoire Navier. Uh, first I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss formulation and homogenization of stress gradient materials. And I should emphasize the fact that uh, what I'm going to be discussing uh, today is mostly the work of Vin Fuk Tran, who was a former student with uh, Karam, uh, Johan Guillaumino and myself. Maybe just a very brief definition of what we mean by stress gradient material. Uh, we all know strain gradient materials where the uh, uh, st uh, st strain energy density depends on the strain and its gradient. Uh, while stress gradient materials are defined the same way with respect to the uh, complementary energy density, which now depends on the stress uh, and its first gradient. And we uh, assume uh, that the stress principle of Cauchy still applies, uh, which means that the uh, stress tensor is still governed by the, equilibrium, the standard equilibrium equation. Um, <coughs> It's, uh, this model is rather, n is rather new, but it's, uh, we think it's quite mature now. It's it was introduced by uh, uh, Samuel and Karam in 2012, and then further uh, a full mathematical justification was published uh, two years ago. Uh, it has recently been extended to uh, uh, finite strain uh, mechanics, and I think uh, Samuel is going to be discussing this later today. Um, uh, so, uh, what I'm going to be discussing now is uh, a different issue. Uh, after briefly uh, giving you a brief overview of the model, I will discuss homogenization of stress gradient materials. Um, <coughs> And if time permits, I would, lo I would also like to point out some uh, open questions regarding this, m this uh, model. Because as I said, it's a major model, meaning that the mathematical foundation is uh, quite sound, but there are still a few, uh, uh, a few questions regarding the physical meaning of some quantities, which I'm not too uh, sure about. Okay, let's move to uh, the derivation of a stress gradient uh, model for elasticity. Uh, our goal here is, uh, so we assume that the uh, complementary stress energy depends on the gr uh, stress and its first gradient. So what we want to get is the uh, boundary value problem that governs the equilibrium of stress gradient bodies. And to do so, we will minimize the stress gradient, um, sorry, we, we will minimize the complementary stress energy. Uh, and uh, this will define a fixed stress gradient body. But uh, you should keep in mind that, that at this point, a fixed stress gradient body doesn't mean uh, anything because we haven't defined the degrees of freedom of the body. So uh, fixed d uh, uh, refers to uh, kinematic conditions and we haven't defined the kinematics of this uh, stress gradient body. But uh, that will be defined later on. Uh, one important point here is uh, the fact that, uh, as you see, the complementary energy depends on the stress and its first gradient. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that the stress is governed by the equilibrium equation which is given here. Divergence sigma is the opposite of the body uh, forces. And uh, it will be convenient to remember that the di divergence of sigma is nothing but the uh, gradient of sigma contracted with respect to the last two indices. And in the remainder of this talk, um, I will define the trace of the third rank tensor. It's only uh, a convenient definition. Uh, a third, the trace of the third rank tensor will be defined as the contraction with respect to its last two indices. So the trace of the third rank tensor, uh, it's my definition and it's uh, a vector. Okay, so the uh, divergence of sigma is the uh, the divergence of sigma is the trace of the stress gradient, which means that all uh, uh, components of the stress gradients are not independent. Some of the components of the stress gradients are fixed by the equilibrium equation. So these components will play a different role in the minimization process. Which may, it now makes sense to introduce a decomposition of the stress gradient into two parts. R, which is uh, uh, trace-free, uh, so it's, it, it's independent of equilibrium, and the complementary part, Q, which is fully governed by the equilibrium equation. 
Okay, the sum of those two components gives the full stress gradient, and this decomposition is made unique by assuming that, by imposing that this uh, decomposition is orth orthogonal. Okay, uh, then this decomposition is a linear operation, so we, which means that R, the trace-free part of the stress gradient, is related to uh, the full stress gradient through a linear operator, which I call I prime, and I prime is effectively an orthogonal projector, and it plays the role of the identity for a trace-free third rank tensors. Okay, so now we can move from this uh, general formulation to this one, where the complementary stress energy depends on the stress, and the stress, stress gradient through its two components, Q and R. Now then, Elementary linear algebra in fact shows that this part of the stress gradient is fully defined by the uh, body forces. Okay, so which means there is no strain measure associated with this stress measure. So, uh, so through in the minimization process, Q actually plays the role of some kind of generalized pre-stress. And the physical meaning of such a pre-stress remains unclear, so we just chose to uh, discard this, uh, this contribution. Okay, so from now on, we assume that the stress gradient material is defined by a complementary stress energy, uh, which depends on uh, the stress grade, the stress, sorry, and its first, uh, and it's the trace-free part of the stress gradients. And now we have all the ingredients to carry out the uh, minimization. We start from uh, the initial problem where we need to minimize uh, the complementary energy subject to the equilibrium equation. And what we really want to do is uh, treat the second part, the, the trace-free part of the stress gradient, as an independent variable. So we do so, we introduce R as an independent variable and add an additional constraint. We have uh, the uh, Lagrange multipliers uh, associated to those two constraints, and in fact, uh, this Lagrange multiplier will play the role of uh, generalized displacement, of a displacement effectively, and phi uh, will be called micro displacement. It's a third order uh, tensor, u is a vector. Okay, if we carry out the optimization, we end up with this boundary value problem, which effectively defines a fixed stress gradient body. And we, have, we now have the equations of, a, a, of the stress gradient elasticity. Uh, uh, no surprise, we retrieve the uh, generalized equilibrium equations. These were the constraints of our problem, so it's, it's not surprising that we uh, would end up with those equations. These are the generalized uh, stress strain relations where E. Uh, is the total strain, which is energy conjugate to the stress, and phi is the, uh, is the energy conjugate to uh, the trace-free part of the stress gradient. So uh, already you can see that phi has a very, a very uh, particular meaning because it, uh, it plays the role of both a generalized displacement and a generalized strain. Okay, so it's quite surprising. And then you have uh, generalized strain displacement relations where, uh, as you can see, the total strain is not the symmetric part of the gradient of a vector field. Uh, it's the total strain minus the divergence of uh, the micro displacement, which is the symmetric part of the uh, 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 gradient of uh, uh, generalized displacement. Okay, these boundary conditions def effectively define a fixed body. I, I don't have time to discuss those boundary conditions. What I would like to emphasize is this continuity condition, which comes from uh, our constitutive assumptions. Uh, our constitutive assumption. Remember that we assume that the stress principle of Cauchy applies for stress gradient material, which means that the traction is continuous. That's, that comes from equilibrium only. But then, assuming that the complementary energy density depends on the stress gradient as well, uh, uh, imposes that not only the traction is continuous, but the full stress tensor is continuous. And that's quite surprising to us mechanicians. Okay, so the full stress tensor must be continuous. Okay, we can now specialize the whole set of equations to linear elasticity, assuming central, symmet uh, central symmetry, the, uh, which means we have no coupling between the stress and its first gradients. 
so we introduce the compliance, the classical compliance and the generalized compliance M and we have to remember that uh, the, uh, that R, the generalized stress, is uh, trace free. Okay, uh, so M, the generalized compliance, op operates on trace-free uh, tensors. It maps a trace-free tensor onto a trace-free tensor. Okay, and in mathematical terms, it means that uh, M must be invariant uh, through this multiplication. That will uh, be important later on. Then. Uh, Deriving uh, the energy, uh, the complementary energy density with respect to the generalized st stresses gives you the uh, uh, st stress strain relationships, which can then further be inverted. And attention should be paid to the fact that L, uh, well, the generalized compliance is not is actually not invertible. Uh, so uh, L, the generalized uh, uh, stiffness, is in fact the, the pseudo inverse of the generalized compliance. Okay, uh, if we sp sp uh, specialize again those equations to uh, isotropy, remember y yesterday we saw that isotropic strain gradient materials were defined by seven, uh, seven parameters. In fact, owing to this condition here, uh, stress gradient materials are defined by only uh, five parameters. So classical Lamé coefficients plus three uh, material internal, internal lengths. Okay, and we proposed a nice decomposition of uh, the generalized stiffness into three different, uh, into three uh, basis tensors, uh, and J, K, the six order, six order J and K tensors play a very um, similar role to the J, uh, to the fourth order J and, F and K tensors, which are well known in uh, uh, classical elasticity. And in fact, this led us to introduce uh, further simplification of this model where there is only one material internal length. Uh, so we, we took this form for the classical uh, compliance. This is the normal form with mu, uh, which is the shear modulus and mu the Poisson ratio. And for the generalized compliance, we just introduced this material internal length, leaving the remainder of the expression unchanged. Okay, so this might seem a bit Artificial, but it's in fact, if you look carefully into this uh, formulation, you uh, you could uh, you can really uh, you can uh, uh, easily observe that it's uh, actually very similar to the one um, parameter uh, strain gradient model. It's in fact the same line of reasoning that led to the uh, uh, the strain gradient model with only one material internal length. So we we use uh, a very similar uh, um, approach to introduce this uh, simplified model. Okay, so it's time to move to homogenization now. And uh, there are three interesting cases where, uh, to discuss uh, when we talk about homogenization of uh, stress or, for that matter, strain gradient materials. We could start from, at the micro level, micro level start from stress gradient and end up with a stress gradient, start from stress gradient and end up with a classical material, and, or start with a classical material and end up with a stress gradient. Uh, the, the first case won't be discussed, I think, this week. Uh, the second case, uh, starting from Cauchy, ending up with stress gradients, will be discussed. It's, it's actually probably the most, uh, the most interesting, and Karam will be discussing it, I think, tomorrow. And I'm going to be addressing the, uh, uh, arguably, the most simple case, which is uh, starting from stress gradient materials, ending up with uh, uh, Cauchy materials at the macroscopic uh, level. Uh, so, uh, again, when we discuss homogenization of, of uh, materials with internal material lengths, uh, we need to complement the classical uh, condition of separation of scales, which uh, uh, only relates to geometrical conditions. Uh, uh, we also need to add a condition which relates the material internal length to the geometry of the problem. Okay, and depending whether your material internal length L sits here, 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 or here, uh, you will end up in one of those cases here. So we basically assume in the in this talk we assume that we are in this area here. Material internal length is of the size of the heterogeneities, comparable with the heterogeneities, meaning that once we homogenize, what we expect is a Cauchy material. 
since it's a Cauchy material, the macroscopic uh, constitutive law is a simple uh, stress-strain linear relationship with, where uh, this guy here is the macroscopic stress, it's just the average of the st uh, local stresses, while uh, the macroscopic strain is the average of the total strain, which means it's the average of the uh, symmetric part of the gradient of the displacement plus a contribution of uh, the micro displacement. Okay, so again, this is a bit surprising. This uh, last uh, last term. In a computational uh, setting, if you want to estimate the effective properties of uh, uh, such a material, you need to first compute the apparent properties of uh, finite, size, uh, finite size statistical volume element. And to do so, you need to solve a local problem. And this is a very standard local problem you have to solve. So equilibrium and uh, nobody forces, uh, constitutive laws, strain, uh, strain displacement relationships, and appropriate boundary conditions which must of course fulfill the uh, Hill-Mandron uh, lemma. And the Hill-Mandron lemma for stress gradient materials uh, uh, is written in this fashion. On the left hand side you have the internal power written at the microscopic level and on the right hand side the same quantity written at the macroscopic level. And uh, you should uh, I should emphasize that since we expect a Cauchy material at the macroscopic level, there is no contribution of phi uh, on the right hand side of this, uh, of this uh, equality. Okay? And once you, we have the generalized Hill-Mandon lemma at hand, it's uh, possible to formulate uh, various boundary conditions that fulfill this lemma. And in particular, I, would like, I, don't, like, I don't have time to discuss all those boundary conditions. Uh, I would like to emphasize this one here, which might seem quite surprising. Uh, Sigma bar is the prescribed macroscopic stress. It's a constant stress tensor. And the uniform stress boundary conditions uh, are, uh, well, basically, the full uh, stress tensor is prescribed at the boundary. Okay? Remember that uh, stress gradient material requires a continuity of the full stress, strength, stress tensor, and this is compatible with this uh, boundary condition. Okay, so again, this is the prescribed macroscopic stress, it's a constant, and uh, the boundary condition reads, uh, well, imposes the full uh, stress tensor. Okay, we can, uh, I, I will maybe vi uh, skip this one. Uh, just, no, just a few words on, on this one. You, you can have the same kind of variational formulation of the effective properties of uh, stress gradient materials and also the same kind of, of bounds. Uh, it's fairly similar to what uh, Huet obtained uh, in the classical setting and you, where you know that uh, kinematic boundary conditions provide you uh, with uh, upper bound and cinema. Um, um, and static boundary conditions provide you with a lower bound on the effective stiffness. We get essentially the same results uh, for stress gradient materials. What is more surprising maybe is the so-called softening size effect. Again, I maybe don't have time to discuss the, whole, the full slide. I will uh, skip to the results. Uh, you, you might probably be familiar with the stiffening size effect uh, observed in nanocomposites. Uh, in nanocomposites, when you decrease the size of, an in, of the inclusions, keeping uh, uh, all of the quantities identical, meaning same fraction, volume fraction, same elastic properties. You decrease the size of the inclusion, and usually what you observe is an increase of the, of the stiffness. And uh, that's actually what uh, what a strain gradient model would gi would give you. Okay, that's observed. That's what observed with a strain gradient uh, model. And actually, you observe the opposite effect with a stress gradient model. So which is proof enough that stress gradient models and strain gradient model, uh, models are not equivalent, they are, they are complementary. Okay? Uh, whether this model is um, uh, physically meaningful remain, uh, remains an open question. We need to find uh, composites which uh, exhibit this uh, softening size effect. Okay, but if we can find a, a material, a real material that has this softening size effect, then strain gradient uh, mechanics would be uh, uh, you would be useless in this case. Whereas stress gradient might be uh, helpful to uh, provide a model of uh, such a material. <coughs> 
Okay, just a quick application. Um, so we have the general framework for homogenization. Uh, of course, we could we could perform full fi uh, full field simulations in order to compute the effective properties of a composite with spherical inclusions. What we did with VIN is just uh, use uh, standard uh, HLB approaches to uh, propose. Um, estimates of the effective properties of such materials. Um, and uh, so, I suppose it's nearly my time, so I, I need to uh, shorten. No, 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 don't okay, okay. So, uh, VIN, not pushing VIN solved, solved the, uh, first solved HLB's problem, which is one single inclusion embedded in an infinite matrix. Uh, I will skip the details, it's, uh, it's quite uh, he was a very dedicated student and he, uh, uh, he did all the analytical calculations and uh, going to the, to the results, uh, here is a plot. Uh, so we, the, the inclusion is submitted to a uniaxial uh, uni stress and what is plotted here is the, uh, is the actual stress, sigma ZZ, uh, along the vertical axis for various uh, values of the material internal lengths. So different colors mean different um, uh, internal lengths of the matrix and different symbols mean different uh, lengths uh, within the inclusion. And what we observe is when both internal lengths are small, we, are, uh, we retrieve a classical case. There is no surprise here. Um, but uh, we, when we increase the material in internal length, there is a... Uh, um, there is a kind of boundary layer that occurs at the boundary between the inclusion and the matrix. And again, that's not a surprise. It's the same effect that is observed for strain gradient materials. Again, what is not a surprise is that the theorem of HLB does not apply, which means the uh, stress is not uniform within the inclusion. Uh, but still, the average stress within the inclusion is uh, linearly related to the remote stress, and we can define a uh, stress concentration tensor which relates the remote stress to the average stress within the inclusion. And this uh, stress concentration tensor then provides you with the uh, Moritana estimate of uh, the effective properties. Okay, so uh, very briefly, we uh, with uh, the solution of HLB's problem at hand, we solved, we considered uh, a composite with uh, uh, spherical inclusions. Uh, the, vol total, the volume fraction of inclusions is F. And uh, using the uh, stress concentration tensor that, that uh, VIN ob uh, obtained, we were able to uh, compute the uh, estimate of the effective properties of uh, such materials. Uh, so on, this, on these plots, so the left-hand side is the effective bulk modulus, right-hand side effective shear modulus, so it's e essentially the same plots. Uh, on this slide, the orange means stress gradient, while blue means strain gradient, okay? And in between, the gray curve is the classical case, classical Moritanaka estimate. As you can see, you explore two different regions of the, of the plane with stress and strain gradient materials, okay? And when you increase uh, the material internal length, you go to the Royce or void bound. So all this is expected. Uh, what I think is nice with this uh, plot is that it really shows that uh, the um, stress and strain gradient never overlap. They are, they are really complementary models. Okay, if I can take two or three minutes just to point out a few questions, as I said, uh, regarding uh, this model. So, uh, I hope I have convinced you that the mathematical formulation of this model is, uh, is sound. Uh, what remains unclear to me is how should we interpret uh, U and phi? So U uh, effectively, uh, I, I called it a displacement, but it's not really a displacement. And phi is a micro displacement, but it's also, it's also a strain, so it's a bit strange. Uh, so going back to our assumption that the strength principle of Cauchy applies, what I want to, to consider now is more general, uh, general uh, boundary conditions not only fixed stress gradient bodies, but any kind of boundary condition. So I, I consider a body where uh, on part of this body uh, I apply a displacement, U, uh, and on the other part of this body I apply a traction, T. Okay? 
And in order to carry on the optimization of the total complementary uh, energy, not only the uh, uh, stre um, uh, complementary stress energy, but the total uh, complementary energy, I need to introduce the complementary work of uh, the prescribed displacement. And this is my assumption. I assume that this complementary work has the same expression as for classical uh, materials. So maybe this is a flow of my uh, reasoning. Maybe the flow is here. I don't know. Uh, but once I've made this assumption, I can carry on the minimization of the total uh, complementary energy. And this is what I get. <coughs> I get these boundary conditions uh, where uh, when the traction is prescribed, I, I, I retrieve the classical boundary condition, which I'm quite happy uh, with. And this com boundary condition must be complemented with a, a kind of uh, reduced kinematic condition. But what is more surprising is this one here. On this boundary, uh, I applied a displacement, a prescribed displacement, but this prescribed displacement now applies to a combination of u and phi. Okay? So from this perspective, um, the displacement, the physical displacement is not exactly u, but it's a mix between u and phi. Okay? So now I have the equations of a boundary value problem for uh, a stress gradient body. I can take the, uh, uh, the uh, strain energy co uh, corresponding to this problem and uh, Sorry, I can take the, the potential energy for corresponding to this problem. And if I do that, uh, so it's the, the dual formulation of the, uh, of the complementary strain energy, I can show that uh, the solution to this problem here minimizes uh, this potential energy where uh, the uh, potential strain energy, there is no surprise here for, with the potential strain energy, there is a surprise here with the uh, um, with the work of the prescribed body forces and tractions. Why is this surprising? Because uh, the volume term here is, uh, is read, uh, reads as expected, meaning that U is uh, energy conjugate to the body forces. Okay, so from this perspective, I would like to think that U is a displacement. Okay, but now if you we turn to this term where uh, the, uh, we address the body, uh, the prescribed tractions at the surface, the, what is energy conjugate to T is not U but U plus something, and that's surprising. Why uh, should my body uh, make a distinction between a surface force and a volume force? Okay, depending on, the, on whether the force is, uh, uh, applies to a surface or to a volume, the conjugate uh, variable is not the same. And this I don't really understand. Uh, well, there might be other comments I might, I might make, but uh, I, I will stop here. And uh, jump to the conclusions. Uh, I have presented you a simplified uh, model for isotropic uh, stress gradient elasticity, applied it to homogenization, and as uh, expected, uh, such model exhibits a size effect, which is, uh, uh, what is less expected is that the size effect is a softening size effect. And what we would like to do now, what, well, it's partly done, we would like to, we have done this, um, uh, derive hashin strickman bounds on the effective properties, uh, explore uh, in detail the other homogenization case which would be starting from a Cauchy at the micro, uh, micro level and going to the uh, stress gradient at the macro level and personally I would really like to understand what really uh, this uh, U means and with that I thank you for your attention. Questions? Um, you made this decomposition Third order stress like tensor. Yes. Uh, which is 18 dimensional, if I understand it well, into a deviatoric part and an extra part. Yes. So this R, what, what is the subset R? What does it look like? Is it a space? What is the dimension of that? It's, uh, its dimension is 15. Yeah. Uh, and it's indeed a subspace. It's uh, 
the subspace of, of uh, third rank tensor which uh, with z uh, zero trace, meaning that the contraction with respect to the last two indices in, is zero. So you are eliminating uh, three dimensions by... Well, in fact, uh, maybe it's easier to understand the space, uh, the complementary space, the space of the Q tensors is generated by, uh, is, uh, all Q tensors are, have this form here, where I is, I4 is the identity tensor, the fourth rank identity tensor, and B would be any vector, and that would generate the whole space uh, of Q tensors, and the orthogonal set is the uh, space of R tensors. Um, well, I would like to ask a question which is maybe foolish, I would say. Um, you have always the continuity of your attraction at the boundary. Mm -hmm. And we also know that at the boundary we have a surface stress. So the jump of the attraction is compensated by a surface stress. And I was wondering, I know how to do it when you have a strain gradient-based theory, how to incorporate it. So I was wondering, is it possible to also incorporate it in a stress uh, gradient theory? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, okay, Kahama has an answer. It might be possible. I think it might be possible uh, having a, uh, a mixture in, in, say, in one direction we, we are m m uh, more stress gradient, and in another direction we would be a strain gradient. Which means the question would be how do you formulate this? Because uh, you can't define uh, complementary stress energy in this case, uh, or uh, 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 strain energy. But uh, you could. You could assume that, uh, I don't know, the uh, projection along the vertical axis of the strain gradient acts in the energy and uh, then the projection along the original horizontal plane of the stress gradient acts in the, in the same energy form formulation. But then you would have to have some kind of mixed energy which combines a, uh, a bit of stress gradient and a bit of strain gradient. But I've, I've been wondering about this, yes. Uh, when you consider the problem of the effective properties of distribution. 
Well, I, I, I don't agree with your statement that the uh, Moritanaka estimate uh, relies on uniformity of the stress within the inclusion. It's only a technical matter that the uh, stress or strain is uh, uniform within the inclusion. It makes matters simple, uh, more simple. But the mo if you uh, look at the whole Moritanaka process, uh, it's just a matter of relating the average stress within the inclusion to the remote stress. And that's what we did here. Uh, indeed, uh, you are quite right, the, the uh, local stress is not uniform in, within the inclusion, I agree with you, but we only need, from the homogenization perspective, what we really need is an estimate of the average strain with, uh, stress within the inclusion, okay? So, what, uh, uh, what is the, it is uh, the exact solution. <laughs> that you have the uniform stress inside the inclusion, but here it is not exact, you neglect okay. local effects on the boundaries, on the uh, boundaries of the inclusion. And this local effects, when you make the average, uh, you neglect them, so some... No, 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 you, you have exactly the same problem. I mean, uh, this is the exact solution, okay? The average stress, uh, the, uh, uh, this relationship is exact, okay? Okay, and uh, then when you combine this solution to get the estimate uh, of the effective properties of a composite, whether you are classical or non-classical, uh, uh, this combination is always approximate. You always need interaction. Uh, you neglect interaction between inclusions. But uh, le 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 let me just finish. Uh, maybe what you mean is that. Uh, in fact, there, there is not one HLB problem, there are two HLB problems, the inhomogeneity and the inclusion problem. And both problems are equivalent in classical elasticity, but maybe that's what you mean. And in uh, stress or strain gradient elasticity, uh, the uh, inclusion and inhomogeneity problems are not equivalent. So what we used here is the uh, inhomogeneity problem and we derived Moritanaka estimates based on this inhomogeneity problem. And I agree with you, if we had adopted the, uh, uh, the other problem, the uh, equivalent inclusion problem, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, HLB's inclusion problem, we would probably have ended up with a different Moritanaka estimate. And both estimates coincide in uh, classical elasticity. Is that what you meant? Concentration tensor is position of failure in your... I'm sorry? Concentration tensor, tensor or, stre or concentration tensor. So concentration of stress or strains, does it position depend? Well, no, no, not as I have defined it, because I have defined my concentration tensor as relating the uh, remote stress, which is not position dependent, to the average stress within the inclusion, which is not, uh, no longer position dependent. Uh, we should stop, but uh, quick questions and answers. Just a question. If you would like to think the dissipation is something that is not so clear, primarily, if you would like to express the, the stress gradient in terms of being uh, dynamics, what would be the uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there was another question? No. You change your mind. Okay. So let's thank.